welcome book nerds to another facebook live session and uh, i am you know feeling ecstatic to be honest to be conversing with uh, manak dhar uh, at the author of this book right here brand new start and you know i I'll, i'll be asking manak a lot of questions uh, uh, during this facebook live sessions of course because this is a mark you know departure from what he usually writes so th- those questions are of course uh, there but uh, first of all for those of you who don't know about him he has written 15 books and in all sorts of genres you know so he has you not stuck to one genre and that i love about authors that is always so wonderful you know experimenting with genres and uh, he of course is a ceo with an mnc he started his career with png and you know before that he has graduated from the iim ahmedabad although in the book he has not kind of you know boasted about it and that was something which was kind of you know uh, that stuck with me also and now during the pandemic i suppose he came up with this book and he has been helping uh, even last year he has been helping a lot of people you know um, get more value out of of course this period and you know be the best brand you know that's what this book is all about you know finding your you know niche and you know sticking to it and of course doing well in your career i mean that's that's the entire purpose so welcome manak first of all to this facebook live uh, thank you so much for taking time out no oh, thanks so much for having me here and uh, really looking forward to our chat yeah so uh, first of all um, i mean why haven't you overstated it that you are from i am amdabad because you know a lot of people you know do this i mean it's kind of sometimes it works sometimes it works sometimes it doesn't uh, how does one find a balance you know of doing that see see for me uh, where you studied where you work are a part of who you are they're not who you are yeah. so for me there's no question of overstating or understating my purpose in this book was to share experiences of what i have learned over the years about how you can build a more compelling personal brand so it's almost incidental where i studied i mean i happened to go to a certain college 26 years ago fine doesn't matter so uh, i i think you know if anybody feels they need to overstate okay. uh, where they studied or where they work then they probably need to rebalance a bit to you know who are you actually and where are you actually adding value to others so so that's how i i think of it yeah great to know that and i um I actually loved uh, page number five, and I would like to quote from there. Um, I have looked for a job, faced uncertainties at work, and have worked with difficult bosses who did not seem to get me. I have not always been successful, but I have always learned from those experiences. This book that you hold in your hand is less about me thumping my chest, talking about how I have got it all figured out, and more about how I had wished someone had nudged me in the right direction. when i was interviewing for my first job when i was told i wasn't doing well at work when i grappled with a big organizational change or when i crossed paths with a boss who seemed to be from another planet and this was super funny and you know it's so much you know it's 25 years you know you go through so much and the first interview you know you're so everybody's nervous on their first interview so i mean since you have you know uh, jump genres also um how does one come up with this book exactly what happens and uh, about this paragraph of course yeah so i guess a little bit about this book and why this book happened see till this book happened i had written non fiction earlier but i had largely written fiction so most of what i had written recently had been thrillers you know like sniper's eye or 0302 and i enjoy writing thrillers yeah. i'm a guy who likes writing about stuff being blown up likes writing about <laughs> characters being put in high stress situations i love, I love your, I love your uh, titles also like alice in deadland <laughs> you know it's yeah. not, you know subtle yeah. at all <laughs> yeah so actually you know early in 2020 i was actually working on another thriller which was part of the series i had started with sniper's eye yeah. and then of course the pandemic hit all of us and i kept hearing about you know people losing jobs or people facing uncertainty so i thought look let me see if i can do something to help so i just put out an open offer on linkedin saying if anybody needs advice help 
guidance, reach out. So I was a bit surprised when within a couple of weeks, over two dozen people reached out, largely young people, uh, you know, because that's when you need advice the most. You know, after a few years of working, you have your mentors, you have bosses you work for, you have your network of colleagues. Yeah. It's when like, we've all gone through that time at different points in our life. When you're starting out your career, first few years of working, you have no idea how to navigate things. And, uh, I started chatting with a lot of these young people, you know, helping somebody with a resume, helping somebody prepare for an interview, helping somebody, you know, think through, should I go for option A or option B in my career? And uh, as I was chatting to them, I found myself repeating many common themes. You know, very common one was, why do you want to do what you want to do? So a really young, smart kid, he said, I want to go into FMCG. So I said, why? And he said, no, it sounds exciting. I said, no, but drill down into what are your strengths? What are you passionate about? Don't chase something because your friend is doing it and he or she likes it. Secondly, you know, this whole area of how can you play to your unique strengths? Every one of us is different. Right. It's not about succeeding to somebody else's standards, but really finding what success means for you. How do you think about, you know, what I call moments of truth, whether it's an interview, your resume, how can you be more deliberate? So I was chatting with these young people and sharing my experiences because I'm not a theory guy. Okay. Yeah. Confession to make here is I don't read a lot of, you know, quote unquote, self-help books. Yeah. So I was literally telling them stories of, look, this is the time when I screwed up in my career. This is the time when I was making a choice and how I thought of it. And sometimes I got it right. Sometimes I didn't. <clears throat> so then it was kind of after a while, a thought bubble went off in my head that, look, why don't I actually put this down in the form of a book, which could maybe reach more people because I got a sense that many of these uh, young people could use that uh, uh, advice. And that's how this book resulted. And, you know, the paragraph you talked about, that's something I genuinely believe in because, you know, the reason I don't like reading, not all, but some self, you know, self-help books is they pretend to have all the answers. I feel sometimes the best way you can help somebody is help them ask the right questions. Every single one of us is different. Every single one of us has our own journey. And I literally said, look, 25 years ago when I began my career, there are so many things I wish somebody had helped me with. How to write my resume? I had no idea. I just asked some seniors, friends, and we were figuring it out. When I began working, I had no idea how to navigate the workplace. Uh, when I first moved to a new role with a boss who, you know, things didn't seem to get off to a perfect start. I just stumbled along, figured it out. And along the way, I was lucky to have some good mentors and um, coaches who helped me. But for me, it was really saying, look, how do I distill some of that learning and experiences to help people ask questions? So uh, let's talk about LinkedIn. I mean, it yeah. has been you know, referred to a lot in the book. And yeah. you know, a lot of people get great value from there. So I am, uh, you know, going through LinkedIn, like the usual, you know, stuff, you yeah. know, it has become like the Facebook for me. I don't know why, but, uh, you know, uh, I come across a lot of posts and I won't take any names here, but you know, a lot of posts bashing, you know, colleges, the kind of yeah. learning we have yeah. in India, or even abroad. I mean, it's kind of a West thing <clears throat> and taking no names, of course, but, uh, what's happening here? I mean, there is a lot of bashing going on online. See, if you ask me, um, uh, social media broadly, and you know, we, we'll come to the specific aspect we talked about. I think what happens with social media is uh, used badly, according to me, right? Uh, it's my point of view is sometimes it just becomes an outlet for narcissism, which is why on places like Facebook and Insta, it's all about me posting my selfies and my perfect life and my holiday, it's all about me, myself and I, or it becomes uh, all about, let's call it armchair activism, where you're, you're feel, you feel compelled to take an extreme position yeah. on something because that's what will generate uh, yes. clicks and likes. I, I think, see, on any subject under the world, I, I think uh, every subject should be debated, but rationally. Yeah. And my belief is most things in the world um, there is no one extreme position. I think the reality is through a process of dialogues. So if you ask me about the specific question of colleges and bashing, I, you know, there's an extreme point of view, which many people put out there saying, hey, in today's day and age, why do kids need to learn anything? They can look everything up on Google. Yeah. What they forget is the people who invented Google actually were really smart people who had great skills which they honed. Oh, yeah. right? They didn't wake up one day and do it. So the reality is it's somewhere in between that, look, I don't think education should be what it was 30 years ago. Yeah. When, you know, when I was in school, everybody kind of went through life on autopilot, that you get yeah. decent grades, you want to become a doctor, an engineer, that's it. 
I think the way the world has changed, there are many differential opportunities available for people, many different ways they can grow their talents. And for me, it's not just a theoretical thing. I have a 12 year old son as he grows up. I think a big thing for kids today is, hey, there are many things you can explore that were not even possible when we were their age. So I think as parents, our job becomes to have an open mind, help kids explore, learn. At the same time, I think taking an extreme view and completely devaluing what education brings is also wrong. Because if you think of a college experience, uh, it is about learning, but it's not just the syllabus. You learn many other skills. You learn how to work with people. You learn how to work in groups. You learn how to lead groups. You learn organizational skills. I mean, if I think of my time in college, I'd say the highlights for me in college uh, were not the academics when I was in uh, Delhi University. It by was that way, was. A, by the way, yeah. sorry to cut you off. Uh, you published two books in college. That's crazy. yeah, yeah. Yeah. So, you no, know, so for me, the next, so next for time. me, so for me, one of the highlights was that really uh, experience crystallized in my mind that I was passionate about writing. Yeah. And uh, because I thought about what I wanted to do, it was the friendships I formed. I love debating. So I think college is not just about the textbooks. And I think when people take an extreme view, they kind of miss out on all the other social aspects you get out of uh, yeah. uh, being in college. Yeah. And it's such such a relevant time, you know, a lot of, you know, and uh, and some people on the team, on our team are missing, you know, and they, they are in college, they enrolled there, for example, yeah. any university, and they can't go there. I, mean, I know. A couple of years, you know, they can't show and uh, show up. I mean, it's crazy. I mean, the way they have been, you know, kind of, I mean, short change, perhaps. Um, uh, a lot of people, there are some myths that you have mentioned uh, yeah. in the book, and I'll just mention them and uh, tell us a little bit about them because these are very common ones. Like, let's talk about personal branding itself. And you have defined it, of course. Uh, it can be kind of, you know, a lot of people think that a personal branding is like, you know, just, you know, looking good, perhaps. Yeah. Uh, the general, you know, sort of uh, uh, impression is that. So the first myth you have mentioned is personal branding is all about networking and selling. So, why is that a myth? I mean, a, a lot of people might be thinking like that. No, I, I think if you think of what branding is in its broadest sense, right? When people say, oh, personal branding is all about looking good, putting on appearances. Yeah. Uh, what people miss is ultimately a strong brand is not just having a great packaging, but terrible product inside, right? Yeah. Uh, strongest brands that are there in the world are ones which are authentic, which actually deliver on what they say, which actually serve consumers. If you look at brands like Apple yeah. and Nike, like Apple is not just a great looking computer, but inside it's crap. It's not, right? Because they're <laughs> constantly innovating, making technology more accessible and easier for people. So I think what people miss out sometimes is on personal branding, uh, they take a very superficial view. And as if you think about brands that actually stand the test of time, it's uh, brands which are really authentic, they're genuine, they're trying to serve people. And it's the same for personal branding. It's less about looking good. I'd say it's more about genuinely being good and uh, uh, not just good in terms of your qualities, but good in terms of having a compass about a purpose, wanting to help others, being authentic to who you are. And I think that's where personal branding starts. It doesn't start with the clothes you wear and how you speak and uh, whether you party a lot with people and network or not. I mean, they're all part of the puzzle, but they're not the first or most important things that define your brand. So so you you have been recruiting a lot of people. Also. You have been in those roles. Um, <clears throat> tell us a little bit about some specific experience, you know, because, you know, a lot of uh, recruitment processes are like, you know, you do this, 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 it's an <clears throat> algorithm and that's about yeah. it. You mentioned this on your resume and a lot of TPOs in colleges do this. Uh, and uh, yeah, I mean, uh, I've been one back in the day, so I can, I know <laughs> that I have done it. So, you know, uh, I mean, what what is the one thing that we need to be careful about, you know? Yeah, I guess the biggest thing I would um, look at as you, whether whichever side of the table you're on, whether you're recruiting or you're looking for a job is really being conscious of fit. And uh, I, I think that's something which people don't often consider because they start with, does this person have a degree? Many people may have that degree. Does this person have certain experiences? Many people have that experience. And by fit, I mean, from an organization standpoint, you know, what's the culture of the organization? How does work get done? What kind of people tend to succeed? And from a candidate standpoint, 
am i going to thrive in this place by being myself yeah. uh have i done enough homework on finding out what kind of place this is and will i fit in there so one thing which i mentioned in the book also is a lost opportunity many candidates have in interviews is when the interviewer says do you have any questions yeah. some people don't ask any questions some people ask questions but they're all about the real let's say transactional aspects you know the designation where this might be the package, the package. <laughs> and see those are those are not unimportant questions but if you think of it your own the most important decisions we make in life the people we date the people we marry the people we become friends with yeah. we don't make them by listing options in a, sp- a spreadsheet and comparing features right they're made based on where do we think we'll have compatibility yeah. where do we think there's a natural meeting of minds and that's equally important as you're thinking about your career so as a recruiter i try and always understand what's the motivation of this person yeah. how does this person define success does that fit with how uh, um we would want work done in our organizations so if i think about the kind of organizations i have been in they're largely i'd say very uh, collaborative organizations it's less about you need an individual superstar who is thumping his or her chest and if somebody comes across and they might be brilliant they might be really competent but it's really all about me and my success yeah. and they haven't really consciously helped others succeed they may do amazingly well in their career in some other context they may not may just not be a good fit and uh, so those are i think some of the things i think about when i am hiring which is trying to understand people's motivations how they define success and i think for a candidate it's equally important to learn more about the organization and ask those questions yeah a lot of people you said like me myself and perhaps they don't gel with the team and regarding personal branding also how do the, how do these people you know mm. take the feedback i mean once perhaps in an interview you've told them that you are not a team player perhaps yeah. on yeah. the face how does one take it i mean it's very difficult right it is no i i'd say part of the fault honestly rohan is as our is our education system and uh, how we how overall our society progresses because till people grow up to a certain age we define success very narrowly as you know the gpa you've got the grades you've got the rank you've got it's all individual success so if i reflect on my own learnings i have what one, one regret i have about my time at business school is mm-hmm. i think i underutilize the teamwork because all of us were in the mode of assignments grades etc yeah. but the in the real world of work no matter what job you're in yeah. it's all about working with around for people right. and how you get along with people how you inspire people yeah. that's something which our education system doesn't always prepare people for yeah. and you know i think um, as uh, you know i'm giving feedback to somebody that's where i always coach them that look no matter what role you're coming into of course you know you have to be competent but you know one of the branding concepts i talk about is point of parity point of difference being competent is a point of parity there'll be a number of people who are equally good at whatever functional or technical aspect of the job there are yeah. but people shine when they're able to take other people along when they're able to grow people who are working under them when they're able to help others succeed yeah. so that's something which um, i don't think we talk enough about but as a manager and a leader it's something which i think we need to teach people when they're very young Yeah. um you have mentioned that perhaps you had the passion of writing always and there were some you know uh, recruiters or bosses who really <clears throat> appreciated it or perhaps yeah. somebody has a passion for reading yeah. i don't know how much time you get for reading but i'll take your recommendation <laughs> anyways but <laughs> so uh, how does one judge that because it's so tough to say no to money also you know and so i i tell you what i read into it is for me it's less about wh- whether that person uh uh appreciates me writing or not it's irrelevant right okay. it is what it tells me is is this person looking at me as a resource to get work done or is this person genuinely looking at me as a human being who can be a colleague and a friend yeah. right because uh, that's what it tells me right that I hope, uh, other I, person, i hope the other person doesn't know this <laughs> it's okay i'm saying it candidly i've i've i've, I've had mm-hmm. interviews where with people it's all about experiences what you have done and it's fine that's all good yeah. but that's all one part of it now imagine we're going to be colleagues and we're going to work together it's such a pathetic environment if all we do is talk about work and numbers right i mean you do rather work with people who actually want to know a little bit about who you are outside of work what your passions are so it's always telling for me that if i am interviewing someone yeah. or somebody is interviewing me yeah. do they even bother to find out 
what's going on in my family, who's in my family, what my background is, because my life didn't start the day I graduated and started my career. Uh, my life doesn't begin and end with my work day. So that always for me is a hint of a good manager yeah. who wants to get to know people, who wants to get to understand what their holistic self is, yeah. because every single one of us has talents outside of work. Yeah. Yeah. So, you know, somebody who's, uh, let's say, been an amazing sports person, yeah. outside of work or before they began working probably has a lot of insights into leadership and team building yeah. right which uh, they can bring to work somebody who's very creative can bring that aspect to work so i believe it's important to know people beyond just the labels of the degree you have and the years of experience because that's when you can get their unique strengths to uh, uh, work as well yeah uh, let's talk about the iceberg and it has sure. been mentioned a lot of times and you have mentioned that your wife doesn't like it because you mention <laughs> it too much or perhaps she likes it but she is kind of you know you discuss it so much that she's enough okay so that that has happened so um of course um, uh, what about that and it's so interesting you know yeah so the reason i use it a lot yeah i think it fits when we're talking about understanding people and personal branding you know what they say right what you see of an iceberg is only 10% of it is above the water. So a lot of the conversation on personal branding and people tends to be superficial. What do you see? Yes. How this person dresses, how this person comes across, how this person speaks. Yes. At the water line is stuff you can find out. Like you said, you go to LinkedIn, you'll find out the, where this person studied, mm -hmm. where this person worked. But I think the real meat of what makes a person is under the water, which is really what are their passions, what are their values, what are their motivations. That's what it truly takes to understand a person, get the best out of a person, really establish fit, and for an individual to really figure out, look, why am I doing what I'm doing? So, you know, the broad thing called a purpose. So the other reason I always use the iceberg analogy, and maybe I started using it, is that's what my name literally means. So, you know, in the Ramayana, yes. Nanak Parvat is the yes. Yes. mountain that uh, Hanumanji crosses on his uh, way from Lanka. So I, I think I have a natural affinity to it, and I'm a bit like it. I'm an introvert by nature okay. um so uh, you know i've always grown up feeling that look it's a, it's the substance you have within that really matters rather than uh, uh your outward show of uh, uh trying to impress people oh yes uh and on page 53 uh mentioned uh, in the writing business let's come to writing okay. <laughs> uh, that's what we are here for in the writing business we often talk of an elevator pitch which yeah. means summing up the idea in a few words to be able to sell it to a publisher or agent. Yeah. I mean, uh, what's this? I mean, how does one do that? Because just one line. Yeah. So I think that's, I think very commonly what happens is when you're chatting with an editor or you're chatting with anybody. So, you know, a couple of my books have uh, been optioned for uh, film rights. You know, when you're chatting with somebody, yeah. they just say, hey, what's your book about? Or what's the story about? Yeah. And you can't then give them a long winded story. So that's, I think, part of the discipline you need to get into as a professional uh, author of saying, look, if I'm just catching up with somebody and they say, what's your book about? Yeah. What are you going to say in a couple of sentences that not just sums up what it is, but makes yeah. it compelling, yeah. makes it interesting for them. Yeah. And, you know, a part of that's beaten into the discipline for any writer, because when you turn the book back, you see the blurb at the back. That's a really important part of a book yeah. because that's, you know, what the uh, reader is often picking up the book and looking at or in today's day there's an Amazon they're seeing the book description so you're saying literally I have one paragraph to tell people uh, why they should be interested in the book yeah. and I think that's important for writers it's important for all of us you know people have 10 page resumes but hey are you, are you able to hook people in the first paragraph on right. why they should be interested in you and then they can read beyond and learn more about you I, I know so, of so many people who give up on books I mean uh, you also addressed it by the way in this book and you know you have said that if you don't like it like till this point just leave it i mean yeah. you know, it's so honest to be honest because because you know a lot of people leave books you know they start them and leave them i mean it's uh it's a fact uh to be honest um tell me something um uh, you know a lot of people are working remotely uh, uh since 2020 and beforehand we, we used to only hear this from it people and that's about it like remote work uh, what are the new challenges that have come up you know uh, uh, it's a beaten up question but i'm sure a lot of people have lost jobs also they are sitting at home they are also giving interviews online and yeah. not everybody 
was all industries were not like that perhaps absolutely so what what has changed no i'd say the if you are currently working i'd say the biggest challenge is how do you keep that sense of connectivity see because work gets done right you can have meetings you can do your work work will get done and i think a lot of companies have said productivity hasn't suffered okay. uh, however if you think of when we used to go to office you weren't going there just to be productive right. you built relationships with people okay. you uh, got to know people outside of work you had meals with people you had coffee with people and i think what i think uh, a key challenge of remote working is how do you keep the time to do that um not just get caught up in you know i'll just do meeting after meeting and you know one way to compensate for that is just be much more deliberate in having one on one catch up time with people so you know with me and some of my friends and colleagues even say look let's just have virtual parties where we'll just sit together and we can't meet together for a drink of coffee but even if on zoom let's sit together not talk about work just imagine we have gone out together and we're chilling on an evening yeah. and we're chatting about stuff because i think what's easy is we forget the importance of all of that relationship building and connectivity yeah. uh, and i think that's something we just need to be conscious of continuing to build in uh, i think that's the biggest change and challenge that a lot of people who are working are finding and they're missing as well yeah so uh, a book like this i mean how to pick uh, i would say the right sur uh, for it because you know it's tough i mean you can sound really preachy and again you know land up in that zone of kind of you know all those self help books where some people just don't like them i mean it's plain and simple so how to you know kind of uh, navigate through all of that yeah no for me it's simple it's not overthinking on how to navigate it's really asking myself the question of look when i was in the shoes of the readers of this book yeah. what are things i needed and what was i looking for i wasn't looking for somebody to give me a magical answer yeah. but ideally somebody who could share through experiences their learnings yeah. a tone which as you said is not about here are all the answers i have it all figured out but really being honest and authentic on here stuff i figured out a lot of it through the school of hard knocks yeah. and it's really saying look i wish i had somebody who had told me to avoid this pitfall yeah. or you know i figured something out and i'll be happy to share it with so the tonality which i picked up in the book which also relates back to the model i talk about adda which is very common in bengal where i come from is literally it's like friends sitting and chatting and it's like an older brother or an older friend saying yeah. hey you know what this is what happened when i went to college this is what i learned rather than somebody who's a remote guru on a stage giving you gyan it's right. somebody like you yeah. who's been through some experiences and is uh, sharing them with you in a very personal and honest atmosphere yeah um you talk about uh, on page 91 you talk about the zero moment of truth and how important is that uh, oh it's it's knowledge? it's absolutely critical in today's day and age so the zero moment of truth the whole concept was popularized by google when they said look nowadays even before the people want to buy a brand they're looking it up on google nobody walks into a car showroom and says if you think about buying a car they're doing the research before and and i think for our personal brands it's equally important right if you whether it's in a social context or a professional context you meet somebody socially yeah uh and they send you a facebook friend request you're not just going to say yes you're going to look up like who is this person yeah. who, uh, what mutual friends do i have what kind of stuff do they post in a professional setting nowadays no recruiter waits for a person to show up in an interview they're looking up their linkedin profile they're understanding uh, what they post so i think it's it's critical nowadays because our uh, digital footprint tells people a lot about who we are or oh, yes truly <laughs> I, yeah. i'm scared of social media because of that anyways yeah. uh, saba farooq says that exactly my gripe with schools is their emphasis on handwriting okay <laughs> <laughs> what do you have to say about that because you are a writer and uh, do you yeah. write on your laptop uh, do you write with pen and pencil what's up so this is a diary on which i write outlines awesome. for all my books <laughs> awesome. uh, now see so this is like full of scribbles every book that i write uh, then i translate it into a document but my handwriting sucks so it's terrible most people tell me it's worse than the worst doctor's handwriting they've seen <laughs> but uh, but i that's the process i follow so i see up to be honest i don't think in today's day and age it's right or wrong as long as you're able to express ideas in a way that works for you and capture them i prefer writing it out because 
um what i find still is when you write it down it feels more like you're committing to the idea that you put it down i'm mean, i'm just a bit oh, yes. old fashioned that way right yes, yes, once yes. you mm-hmm. write it down you cannot do a backspace and delete it mm-hmm. uh, so mm-hmm. what i when i start a book and i think part of being an author is you have to commit with the discipline yeah. so i i still find there is magic in putting the name of the book down on paper before you have begun wow. uh, because then you're saying look this is something i am going to do i am committing to it now there's no backing out yeah <laughs> goodness and you this is common between you and mr bond up in masuri so oh really well i'm yeah, honored to hear that mr bond yeah, is yes, a legend he, so. he still writes down everything and not even kidding and he he sends those manuscripts to publishers imagine you know? <laughs> <laughs> so it's like you know 400 500 600 pages of written material <laughs> and they have to type it out imagine you know so you know i mean that's crazy Uh, tell us a little bit um, uh, about the publishing process. Uh, it's done by uh, Bloomsbury. We know it's done by Bloomsbury. Uh, yes. So and uh, you know, uh, tell us a little bit about that. Uh, 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 I am not aware about whether you have published with them before, or is it? No, this is my first book with uh, Bloomsbury. So see, I think the publishing process differs widely. To be brutally honest, if you're a new fiction author, it's rough. I got more than fifty rejection slips for my first novel, so oh, it was nerve wracking. Uh, uh, but I think over time, what happens is you get to know editors. You worked with them, so uh, uh, Bloomsbury. Uh, I've never published with them, but I had chatted with the editor once some years ago, and he they just caught up about something, and he said, "Look, if you ever have any ideas, stay in touch." so i i got in touch and look i have this idea and then i think for non fiction especially the publishing process tends to be fairly rigorous because um you then typically have to put in a proposal where you're saying what are you writing on what need is it serving how is it different from other books out there and uh, it goes from there yeah so you have so many books uh, in your background i have to yeah. take your recommendations because of course you uh, guys you have to pick this up and leave your review on amazon that's like said and done but uh, what do you read i mean how do you keep those you know kind of yeah i i read all kinds of things yeah uh, yeah yeah so at any given point of time i'm probably reading two books um so i read many genres yeah that i i love uh, i figured out i figured out because you have mentioned i think in the first line did you mention dostoevsky dostoevsky yeah, 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 yeah you did I just yeah. get right here on the first page. <laughs> so uh, you know, I figured out that you read a lot. So what are you yeah. reading currently? Yeah. So I'll tell you the my all-time favorite author is probably Tolkien. And uh, so I, I knew my son is an even bigger Tolkien nut than I am. We probably have a dozen posted a books. Posted a book. Uh, posted a picture yesterday. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Yeah. So that Tolkien is somebody I love. I mean, it's amazing. He created the whole world, languages, cultures. So Tolkien, I love. I love Carl Sagan. Um. So I, I didn't study science in school or college after class ten, but I think just the whole idea of being curious about how the world works. Um. I love William Dalrymple. I, I've uh, always been a keen uh, student of history. He's amazing. He's mind blowing. Yeah. yeah. um so these are some authors who i make a point of reading almost everything they write yeah. um beyond that there are many other authors i love historical fiction so corn eagleden um bernard cornwell i uh, who else here i'm looking around the bookshelf and seeing who else i like roald dahl scenario anybody in the indian uh, scenario uh, like not only books <laughs> you just love them okay in the indian scenario i'd say one of uh, a couple of the books which really stick out in my mind uh, one is english august i thought that was a brilliant yeah, book yeah, yeah, yeah. that was a i read it many years ago it was brilliant this coming on your fate story i loved the uh, great indian novels by shashi thiru yeah. so um, i i think there are several books which have stuck in my mind i mean the householder by yeah. uh, ruth jhawala so for me what i always resonate to is does it speak to me as a person So Householder was just a story of somebody growing up into being married and having a life, but told beautifully. So mm-hmm. I read all kinds of books. Sir, I loved a lot of uh, Sadat Hasan Manto's books, his translations, yeah. uh, especially the ones set in the time of partition. Yeah. So um, I read, as you can tell, I read all kinds of things. I figured uh, it out. Also, <laughs> also tell me something. A lot of people who are connected to us, they sometimes ask like. why do we have to read i mean we are working in the it industry yeah, yeah. i am a manager and i am reading of course a lot of people like bill gates and you know 
even uh, Mark Zuckerberg, they propagate this a lot. But why does one have to read? Has it benefited you in your work life also? See, I guess uh, the first thing I would say is if nobody should start off by saying I am working in IT or I am a manager because that's not the sum and substance of our life. <clears throat> Some day you won't work in IT. Some day you won't be a manager. And uh, even today, beyond working in IT or beyond being a manager, you're managing relationships. You're trying to figure out what's happening in the world around you. So I think the biggest advantage of reading is it just opens your minds to different perspectives. Because otherwise, if all you do is stick to people around you at work, you're just going to hear more people like you. I think the act of reading just helps you understand about different cultures, understand different points of view, understand how people think about different things. Yeah. And I think it just broadens your mind. And you know, I, if you ask me honestly, that's something we desperately need in the world today. Yeah. Because people are very quick to form rigid points of view uh, and less open about saying, hey, let's chat about stuff without presuming you are wrong and I am right because of <laughs> the color of your skin, your religion, your language. Let's just sit and chat oh my and gosh. talk and have a sane conversation without rushing to judgment. That's not happening on Twitter anyway. <laughs> so, <laughs> okay, uh, uh, Chandan Sen Gupta uh, is asking, do you have to put an effort yourself <clears throat> to market your book while publishing traditionally or the publisher takes care of that entirely? A big question. No, I think it's a very good question, Chandan. I think the reality is uh, the best marketing, if you ask me, that an author can do is to authentically connect with readers. Okay. That's the best marketing an author can do. Yeah. And I, I still remember yeah, my, I, the biggest thrill for me as an author when I began writing was when I used to hear back from readers. Yeah. And at that time, if I think, you know, 15 years ago, it was an occasional email. Nowadays with the technology, you can connect with readers in real time. You can get to know them as people. I think that's the best thing an author can do, not market themselves, yeah. but really say, look, how do I connect with readers, understand what they're liking about my work, share thinking behind the work. Yeah. That's the best thing an author can do. And see, uh, publishers do, of course, good publishers do stuff to help you, whether it's on social media, whether it's in bookstores. But for me, that's the best thing the author can do the second best thing an author can do to market themselves is keep writing okay. because ultimately um ultimately you know as a writer all of us are on a journey we're all work in process so the more you can learn from your work the more you can continue to connect with readers get better as a writer that's the best thing you can do to become a successful writer over the i mean i'm getting greedy my final thing and we'll close this but uh, uh, any one thing that you have learned over like iterations of books uh, that or multiple things that you would like yeah. to learn. I think the biggest thing I learned, uh, and it was a learning I got early the hard way, is you know, there's a cliche which says, write what you know. Yeah. And uh, I'm not entirely a fan of that because you shouldn't literally write what you know, otherwise there would never be fiction or sci uh, there, there would be fantasy or science fiction. But when I began writing my first novel, which I talked about, I sent it out and it was about this young guy who's working in a company who wants to be an author and he's struggling to balance and, you know, I focused so much on that issue that it was really devoid of any context. I didn't even bring any color of where was he. And unfortunately, no editor bothered to point it out. So I just got rejection slips. One editor was uh, uh, generous enough to say, maybe give some more context. So then I set it in Mumbai, which is where I began my career. I put some more local color around it, you know, traveling in an auto in those days to work with Altaf Raja playing in the background. <laughs> and, yeah. because, and then that unlocked in my mind that that same story becomes much more relatable when you're bringing in details which make the characters come to life. And uh, that was a big learning I got, which I try and still do, rather than having cardboard characters. It's the little touches that make people resonate with your characters. Goodness, uh, great learning from this session. And I have learned a couple of things from uh, the book, of course, to how to recruit also, because I also end up, you know, and. I hate those, you know, interviews because I know I don't have it figured out and <laughs> it is very tough to recruit also maybe another book which does just concentrates on that, you know, uh, because all of us, we don't have it figured out and we have small <laughs> teams and, you know, we are struggling with it. But, you know, this has helped uh, me a lot, especially. So just my personal thing. And of course, all the readers out there uh, do check it out. If you are in college and your placements are coming up, you have to check it out. It's not an option also uh, because I, like I said, in the beginning of the session, 
if i had this book back then perhaps you never know you know <laughs> but, <laughs> so yeah um i was stuck uh, with one template of resume for 5 years i told me <laughs> so you know don't do that pick this up it will help you and if you have any other questions uh, menak is of also available perhaps on social media platforms to answer those uh, if he gets time so he will do that and thank you so much mena uh, thanks for coming to you and uh, looking forward to so much more wonderful thanks for having me over it was a pleasure chatting with you okay